Uh, today, I have the honor to um, uh, to uh, present Professor Abdel Hadi Khalili. He's a fellow professor of neurosurgery uh, from Iraq. He's one of the founder of neurosurgery in Iraq. He has a huge um, uh, experience in research and building department from from zero and how to manage uh, neurosurgery in difficult situation through uh, through war through limited resources and uh, he's now in the united states and uh, he's um, uh, very supportive for young people for young young uh, uh, talents let's say uh, within the science in general and has a very uh, unique approach in his career uh, I, I call it always, this is the encyclopedic approach. And uh, actually, we we have a paper describing Dr. Khalili uh, approach to neurosurgery uh, and how uniquely he advanced through all his phases and the steps. And yeah, combining neurosurgery with all the possible surrounding uh, scientific field, this is a unique experience. I will invite you to uh, have uh, his uh, uh, the paper about him describing his work, and I think I will share it with you because it's already free uh, uh, in the Surgical Neurology International. I will share the link for the paper, and you can read up more about that that technique. And uh, Dr. Khalili agree to be with you to share some thoughts that he think. It will be helpful for you as a new generation aspiring to be a scientist and a, a doctor, maybe surgeons in the future. So welcome, Dr. Khalili, and the stage is yours. Thank you so much. It's really a great honor and pleasure to, to be with you in this uh, Neurosurgery TV. Thank you so much, sir, for this opportunity. And thank you, Samer, for the introduction, which was more than... Uh, I think I deserve. Well deserved, well deserved, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sorry I have cough, so I may be interrupted with cough uh, at occasions. I hope not. No problem. <laughs> uh, I'm really pleased with your uh, mentorship, with your initiative to get such wonderful uh, colleagues, young colleagues, uh, trying to pursue the real path of uh, research and and uh, ethical research and to be on the right steps from the beginning which is really the real uh, hope of us to be fruitful and to possibly proceed with the outside world uh, research standards. My presentation would be something general. Sure. Yeah. Uh, today, I have the honor to um, uh, to uh, present Professor Abdel Hadi Khalili. He's a fellow professor of neurosurgery uh, from Iraq. He's one of the founder of neurosurgery in Iraq. He has a huge um, uh, experience in research and building department from from zero and how to manage. Uh, neurosurgery in difficult situation through uh, through war through limited resources, and uh, he's now in the United States and uh, he's um, uh, very supportive for young people for young young uh, uh, talents let's say uh, within the science in general and has a very uh, unique approach in his career. Uh, I I call it always this is the encyclopedic approach. And uh, actually, we we have a paper describing Dr. Khalili uh, approach to neurosurgery uh, and how uniquely he advanced through all his phases and the steps. And yeah, combining neurosurgery with all the possible surrounding uh, scientific field, this is a unique experience. I will invite you to uh, have uh, his uh, uh, the paper about him describing his work, and I think I will share it with you because it's already free uh, uh, in the Surgical Neurology International. I will share the link for the paper, and you can read up more about that that technique. And 
Dr. Khalili agree to be with you to share some thoughts that he think it will be helpful for you as a new generation aspiring to be a scientist and a, a doctor, maybe surgeons in the future. So welcome, Dr. Khalili, and the stage is yours. Thank you so much. It's really a great honor and pleasure to, to be with you in this uh, Neurosurgery TV. Thank you so much, sir, for this opportunity. And thank you, Samer, for the introduction, which was more than uh, I think I deserve. Well deserved, well deserved, sir. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm sorry I have coughed. So I may be interrupted with cough uh, at occasions. I hope not. No problem. <laughs> uh, I'm really pleased with your uh, mentorship, with your initiative to get such wonderful uh, colleagues, young colleagues, uh, trying to pursue the real path of uh, research and, and uh, ethical research and to be on the right steps from the beginning, which is really the real uh, hope of us to be fruitful and to possibly proceed with the outside world uh, research standards. My presentation would be something general. Sure. Yeah. So this is just uh, highlights, in fact, of base, some basic ideas and our research challenges in the difficult days we went through, as Samer was referring to. If I give you one dollar, you give me one dollar, each one has one dollar. But if I, if I give you one idea, you give me one idea, each one has two ideas. So giving ideas to each other is really richness to both parties. What's research? The systematic, although I don't need to tell you about this, you all know about this very well, but I just remind you of what, what I have in mind. Uh, it is a systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions. And why do research? Research allows you to pursue your interests. Research makes you learn something new. Research will widen the scope of your problem-solving skills. Research will challenge yourself in new ways. And research, with research, you can do your research alone or in a large team. You don't need to be with, with team, you can do it on your own. Single-handed versus multi-institutional. You don't need to, to shell yourself with your specialty. You have to join other specialties and then make a wider research. You could conduct your research in a library, in a museum, in a laboratory, or community. And your research problems could be aesthetic, social, political, scientific, or technical. You choose the tools, gather and analyze the data report your findings to a wider audience so they will benefit from that. So again, with diligent and systematic inquiry or investigation into this, to, into this, to discover revi or revise facts, theories or application. This revised facts is very important because things which are facts today may be not facts tomorrow. So example of two examples of these revising facts. First example, Antonio Egas Moniz. In 1935, Moniz advocated lobotomy, surgery to treat psychosis and mental health conditions such as depression. It was seen as a miracle cure for mental illness. Moniz was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1949 for that surgery, for that approach. The surgery causes most of the connections to, to and from the anterior part of the frontal lobe of the brain, cognitive centers to be severed. What happens? It was stopped in the 60s and even some advocated to revoke the Nobel Prize from Dr. Moniz. 
And you can see this movie, possibly some of you have seen this movie, that a man flew over a cuckoo's nest by Jack Nicholson. It represents the problems happened after that surgery. Just by the way, Moniz had introduced for the first time in history and geography in 1927. And he used the substance thorotrust as a contrast. And then this thorotrust was discovered to be uh, carcinogenic. And uh, I have seen one of the cases when I was in Scotland of cancer of the liver caused by thorotrust. So again, this was abandoned. So it was fact at one time, but then by, by, uh, by implementation and revision, it was found not a good fact. Another example is the thalidomide. In 1950s, commercially named thalidomide, the miracle drug it was called. It was used to treat morning sickness during pregnancy. And everybody really was happy with that. And then they discovered that it produces massive congenital anomalies. So, and then in the 60s, it was abandoned. And this fact was not a real fact. It was a bad fact. And other, I have two examples of inspiring stories. First example, Hermann von Helmholtz. He is a German doctor. In the 19th century, he is a mathematician. Well, a fan of mathematics, but he was forced by his parents to go to medicine. So he used his talent in medicine and mathematics in medicine when he was graduating. When he was teaching in the uh, medical school, one of the students asked him, sir, you say that we see with our eyes when light goes into the eye. Why do we see the eye black when there is light in it when we can see something? And he said, for two nights I could not sleep thinking of that question. And then it triggered an idea and then he revolutionized ophthalmology by improvising an invention of the ophthalmoscope. And what he did, he just brought a candle near the head of the patient, of the person, and then a mirror with, with a hole inside it. So he can reflect the light inside the eye that through that hole he can see the retina. And then when he saw the retinal artery, he shouted, he was shouting that I am the first man in the mankind history to see a living artery of the, of the, of the human body. So that's the ophthalmoscope which he uh, invented. Eventually was modified, of course. The other example is Claude Bernard from France. Claude Bernard is the father of experimental medicine. In fact, his book, The Experimental Medicine, Study in Experimental Medicine, supposed to be one of the important books in mankind history. I have the Arabic uh, translation of that book. It's an amazing book, really, at that time in the second half of the 19th century. He was amazing. He had so many discoveries. One of the important discovery is the extracellular environment, the homeostasis, that your temperature will be remain the same. Your all electrolytes will be the same around the cell in spite of any changes happens to you outside the, that cell. So he discovered that. But the main thing in, his, in this area is he was working in the lab and then the lab attendant brought him a batch of rabbits. And they, because he was busy, he asked the attendant just to put the rabbit on the table, which he did, and then he left. So the rabbits urinated on that table, and it happens that there was litmus paper on the table where it was changed color with the urine of the, of the rats. So the urine was acidic. And as he has prepared mind, he immediately clicked why this urine of the herbivorous animal be acidic, why it should be alkaline. So he called the attendant again, he said, what's happening? Ari, have you brought these rabbits from different places? He said, no, the same place. But then they discovered, he discovered that the rabbits were starving for eight hours. He was going around until he came to this, to, to Claude Bernard. So he gave the rabbits uh, the food and then starved them again. 
when he gave them the food, the urine turned again to, to be alkaline. And then start them again for eight hours or so, and then it turned to acidic. So, and then he went to his, to his horse. The horse, of course, is uh, herbivorous. So the horse urine was alkaline, and then he starved the horse for so many hours, and then tested his urine and was acidic. And then from there, he, this, he, he put the, the theory of catabolism. When you are herbivorous and you are starving, so you will be carnivorous because you will eat your own meat, your own flesh. So with that limitation of facilities of research at that time, they created such important uh, foundation of, of research. It's interesting to, to note that Charles Holland Duell, he was the commissioner of the United States Pat Patent Office from 1898 to 1901. You'd be surprised that Mr. Jewell stated in 1902 that everything has been invented, has been, can be invented, has been invented. So we don't need to this office. We have to close this office of patents. Now, coming to some personal research ideas and challenges. I must emphasize that in the 60s, research culture in Iraq was developing and later in the 90s, 80s, 90s, until 2003, Iraq was involved in, in wars and sanctions and pursuing research was a real challenge because of lack of facilities, lack of time, lack of interest. People try to survive really, to try, try to get food and something to, to help their children with. It was a difficult time, but nevertheless, you can pursue if you have the dedication and you can uh, do things as my boss used to say, if you want something to be done, ask a busy man to do it. Because a busy man is so or organized, he can fit your request in between. But the one who has nothing to do, he will postpone it till tomorrow or next week. We have plenty of time. Don't worry, I'll do it. Uh, treating, one of the projects was treating resistant epilepsy. Now, what's epilepsy? It's a focus of excessive electrical discharge, swarming rapidly to surrounding areas of the brain, causing seizures. This is a known fact, of course. Ms. Dr. Adrian Upton in Canada, and McMaster, I knew in 1978, in fact, that he, like, he postulated that a feedback of the brain for resistant epilepsy may help minimizing the, the bad effect of resistant epilepsy. So with the University of Technology, I started a project. We bought uh, electroencephalogram to the University of Technology and then with the help of, well, the, well, there was a master student, we gave him the project and with the help of our colleagues the, in electrical engineering, control engineering, we had the project of analyzing the EEG, the electroencephalogram and filtering it into four uh, waves, basic waves of the EEG. And then they changed, they transformed the waves from wave to sound and from wave to light. And Dr. Upton's idea was if the patient hears his alpha waves, he will calm down and then his epilepsy will be probably minimized resistant epilepsy. And so this is the idea was it was there, but of course it was not implemented. Uh, we, we just did this research, but we continued the research in different way. I was dreaming of treating epilepsy by on the principle of lightning protection system. When the electrical charge comes from the cloud will be sucked out by this uh, lightning protection system to earth, and then it will minimize the damage of the electricity. So can we have a portable earthing? And we can put the probe on the area which we diagnose the focus, and then we try to see if we can do that. There is a company in, in England, that was in 1980, 
in 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 England a company called Thackeray. They was interested, but they then I had to come back to Iraq with the war and everything was really disrupted. But then I started with the group of four electrical engineers in the Scientific Research Council in Iraq. We worked for two years, or maybe more than two years about the project, hoping to get something about this. And they worked really very, very hard, these uh, young uh, engineers. But uh, and uh, in 1989, unfortunately, the whole uh, Scientific Research Council was canceled. And then all the project was really uh, went astray, astray. But nevertheless, one uh, lady, a girl, uh, engineer, young engineer, very bright one, uh, Francis Balsis, she got a master's degree with the uh, detection of an epileptic, early detection of epileptic attack. And we published this uh, two papers in, uh, in uh, scientific uh, journals. In 1982, we did head injury in rabbits. With the, with the Professor Morgash from Czechoslovakia at that time and Professor Sahib al Musawi. And there was uh, the, our uh, the master's student, Dr. Ali Abdel Latif, is a very bright guy. He is now in Australia, professor there. And he did the real great work with, uh, with our supervision and then uh, studying the physiological changes of head injury and rabbits. Again, that paper was published in a peer reviewed journal. And then 1985, with the professor of uh, the computer sciences, uh, we worked on uh, diagnosing causes of back pain by the computer. So you can sit uh, on the computer in front of the computer, and then computer ask you, and you answer yes or no, yes or no, all the answers yes or no, and then it takes you to the track, different tracks until you reach a conclusion. It was something simple, but at least it was an attempt. And the, the guy who was uh, having the master's, he got his PhD again in a similar line. And then he was a uh, leading figure in the Ministry of Higher Education. And he became, in fact, ambassador at one time. The other project, which is uh, interesting and painful, uh, we know that third nerve, the third cranial nerves, among other nerves in the uh, moving the eyeball, it has the main main function of moving the eyeballs. When there is damage of the third cranial nerve for any reason, a trauma or uh, after surgery or tumor or whatever, third nerve may regenerate, but in a dis disgeneration uh, uh, fa fashion, the the fibers will go to different nerve fibers to supplying different muscles. So the function of the nerve which elevates the eye here, for instance, it will not elevate the eye here, it will take it down and out. So this is called aberrant regeneration or disgeneration. So I thought, why, why, why is this? Well, we discussed with Professor Mahmoud Hayawi Hawa Ahmash, Professor of Anatomy at that time, a leading researcher, and then he was president president of uh, of uh, a university. And then we planned a very well planned uh, project uh, with the help of uh, the German neuropathologist and uh, American uh, British uh, neurologist. Uh, we studied uh, rabbits, and I used to open the orbital of the rabbit and go back to the orbital apex and to crush the third nerve. And that surgery was difficult, really not easy surgery because the rabbit is not a good animal, experimental animal. The range of uh, anesthesia is, is, is very narrow. If you give more, the rabbit will die. If you give less, it will, uh, it will jump. And then there is a cavernous sinus at the orbit uh, apex. And then if you touch that orbital uh, sinus, uh, the blood loss will, will kill the animal. So we did 12 animals successfully. And we marked them with their ears and everything was fine. And we were watching the progress of those animals. After one year, we came to, to analyze and to get the results and the neuropathology to be sent to Germany. And then we discovered that 
all the rabbits were distributed to different research projects by the attendant of the animal house and all the project collapsed. So my response was, I just smiled and uh, because this is not unexpected in our culture, unfortunately, or society at that time. So that, uh, that happened, but nevertheless, we didn't care about that. So we followed the myth of the phoenix and with Mahmoud Hayawi again, we started spinal cord regeneration in rats and we did a work which took us about a year and a half. And then uh, we published the work uh, in, uh, spy in paraplegia in, in uh, UK. And it was something uh, I think worth mentioning. And then after that, uh, a young lady uh, from the College of Veterinary Medicine, she uh, was doing her PhD under my supervision and again, a professor of surgery at the College of Veterinary Medicine. And we did that on dogs and we had really good results. There is some debate about the uh, methodology, but uh, the results were really amazing. Now, our, uh, in, in Iraq, we have problem with hydatid cysts. Uh, maybe now minimized uh, these days, but this cyst is uh, called cancer of Iraq by one of our professors uh, of surgery in Iraq because, well, it com comes from Kenya, lives in the bowel of the, of the dogs, and then the ova comes from outside uh, from with the feces. When it dried, it will be taken by the sheep or directly will come with the grass or the, with the vegetables to the human. The problem with, with hydatid is this is the cyst and you can see these dots inside it. Each dot, sorry, each dot can produce or each cyst can produce uh, thousands of hydatid cysts like this one here. And this can affect the brain, the eye, the, the lung, every part of the body except the tooth. Any part of the body, it can be affected by the, by the uh, uh, cyst. The trick of surgery is to try to take the cyst out without being ruptured. And this is not an easy task. So many times it is, uh, it, it ruptures. But for that, we put all sorts of, uh, uh, goes around uh, the cyst area with soaked with uh, so many things and then hoping that will help. It will, uh, that never helps. In fact, uh, radically. So what I thought of is, taking the idea of the, this children's uh, pistol where this part comes and stuck to the wall by, by, by vacuum. So I thought of having something like this uh, shower and then having this all uh, shower-like and there is a sucking system inside and then uh, making vacuum here. So when this is stuck on, this, on the cyst, by continuous vacuum, you penetrate the cyst and evacuate all the contents of the cyst, and then it will, the wall will still stuck to the to the instrument, and then you can take everything out. Because the cyst is not attached to the surrounding tissues; it is just free and inside the tissue. And from there, orbital hydatid. I, I'm I'm interested in, in orbit, as uh, Samer knows, and uh, established a uh, center in Iraq called Orbital Surgery Center, and possibly my series of hydatidsis of the orbit, one of the biggest series uh, available in the literature. So the problem with, uh, with orbital hydatid, you see this is the orbit here in the skull, and that's the orbit, thick bones around the, the orbit, and then fat behind uh, the eyeball. And CT scan, when you do CT scan, <coughs> Excuse me. When you see this, you see this scan, <clears throat> the orbital hydatid will show like the tumor. Can you see that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, because it is hidden on, with, in my case, with the with the pictures. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. So you can see the density by CT scan is the same. 
while if you take the liver hydrated or the brain hydrated, it's a different density. It is water. It looks like water, but this is tumor. So I thought, why is this? Is it because the pressure inside the cyst is high as it is in closed box? Or the nature of fluid is different? Or because of the location of the cyst itself? So the first thing I did, I contacted Amu Baba. I know Amu Baba, the father of football in Iraq, soccer. And I asked him for an old football, uh, football, which is made of two parts, leather on the outside and tube inside. So my idea was to push water inside the tube, the inside the ball, the rubber ball inside, push it more water than it can accommodate so that will not rupture because of the wall of the, of the, the outside wall of the leather. I couldn't get it, unfortunately, but nevertheless, I want to proceed with gloves, just ordinary surgical glove. I filled it with tap water and then made out of that small, uh, uh, small ball to put in the orbit and this big ball to put in the cranium. And in that case, so the pressure is the same. And then the nature of the fluid is the same. So we are left with one thing only. So I put again some uh, sheets of fat behind the, the ball, which is in the, in the orbit to simulate orbital fat, and then did CT scan. And in fact, the CT scan I did in, at night. Nobody knew about it. And uh, fortunately, we had an Irish uh, uh, engineer for the CT scan. I called him and he came with me at night. And then we, we used to, to, to get rid of all the negatives because everybody then say we are wasting uh, your, your time, wasting your, your, uh, your money on something useless. So what I did, we measured, we made sure that in the CT scan, both, that both uh, balls are in the same section and then proved to be this is 27 units and this is 4.5 units. So it is about, uh, how much? Uh, six, seven times more density uh, on the CT scan in the orbital cyst than the cranial cyst. And this is very important because if it is a tumor-like, what I do is open the cranium like this man. I open his cranium to get to the roof of the orbit, to get to the orbit, to get the tumor so-called out, it proved to be cyst. And then you feel really ashamed of yourself. So I then improvised this simple surgery uh, to just uh, anterior surgery because of my background in ophthalmology, I can do it on my own, try to get there and then get uh, the cyst out. And then in fact, I presented this in the international meeting in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, about this and my own uh, way of doing it in, 19, in 2008. And it was published, this published in computerized radiology in the US uh, in 18, 1987. With the primitive facilities we have, we have to work something because we have acoustic neuroma patient near the, the facial nerve. And I would like to save the fascian nerve. And with the intermingling of all tissues around it, I don't know where is the fascian nerve. So I have no monitor, I have nothing to, to, to a stimulator to avoid this problem. So with the Professor Abdul Sahib Al Musawi, we did a pin, ordinary pin, molded with, with the thin wire and uh, connected to a stimulator, which he was with me in the, in the theater. And then we, we did the, the stimulation to make sure that the facial nerve was not uh, affected. And you can see nowadays what is going on here with the monitoring of the facial nerve during acoustic neuroma removal. After 2013, I did not, uh, I was, I retired, but I did not uh, stop doing things. I kept uh, doing things. And then uh, this is the journal that uh, I, I made, created, uh, um, uh, an organization called Tawfiq. Tawfiq and then Tawfiq made this Tawfiq Journal of Medical Sciences for three years. I was the editor-in-chief and uh, many distinguished friends with me. 
and then uh, we had uh, activities one of them this awards for all uh, uh, graduate students in the us who are distinct uh, distinguished uh, we can uh, just uh, award them so enough of that let me share with you some principles breakthroughs often come from unexpected and surprising areas so not necessarily to be conventional. You have to think outside the box. And as Lewis Pasteur saying, chance favors the prepared mind. One good example of that, uh, Newton, his mind was prepared. And when he saw the, the apple falling from the tree, it clicked. And the same thing with James Watt when he was with his grandmother, seeing that the top of the kettle when boiling, it was going up for flapping. So he was thinking of the steam engine and then he created this steam engine. So he, his mind was prepared. There were two teams trying to climb the very, very high mountain, uh, maybe in the Himalayas. Uh, one team reached uh, halfway through and then they said, well, the oxygen was uh, less than we can afford, we can uh, acclimatize with, so they stopped. The other team, Again, for any other reason, they stopped in the, in the way. But then they saw one guy went to the top of the mountain and came down. And then everybody was happy and the clapping and then trying to, to get him to respond to their clapping and the happiness for what he achieved. But he did not uh, care about any one of them because he was deaf. So he did not hear any discouragement. He did what he thought is right. So if he was not deaf, possibly he would have joined the club, the two clubs. So being, believing in what you have in mind is very important. And then the other thing you may not know that the entrance of Baghdad University has this, this, uh, this entrance. Each one, in fact, this, this represents a cerebral hemisphere. This is a cerebral hemisphere, and there is a gap in the middle. And he called this the open mind. And this gap would never end, would never fill, be filled. So the mind is, will be always open for information and knowledge. My last thing is, do you know of the chaos theory, the butterfly theory? This is one, uh, but this is uh, well improvised by Edward uh, Lawrence in the early 60s. And uh, this is a butterfly which uh, uh, flaps its wings in, uh, in Brazil. And then there is a tornado in, uh, in uh, Texas, which is very important to remember. And this will be explained by this guy. 1963 by Edward Lorenz and it was it was presented to the New York Academy of Sciences and laughed out of the place. It's crazy. The butterfly effect stated that a butterfly could flap its wings on one side of the world and set molecules of air in motion that moved other molecules of air that would eventually move other molecules of air that could eventually create a hurricane on the other side of the planet. The butterfly effect. It was nuts. But it was interesting. And because it was so interesting, it hung around forever in, in urban legend and movies and books until finally physics professors in the mid-90s proved the butterfly effect was accurate and viable, and it worked every time. And not just with butterflies either. It worked with any form of moving matter, including people. They gave it the status of a law. Just like the law of gravity, the butterfly effect is now known as the law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. And it works every time. See, Chamberlain is a human example of the butterfly effect. One guy who made one move 140 years ago whose effect still ripples through our lives today. And you are no less an example of the butterfly effect than Chamberlain was. Everything you do matters. Every move you make, every action you take matters not just for you or your family or your hometown. Everything you do matters to all of us and forever. 
at the end i say thank you and that's uh, my email and that's why my website if anybody is interested to to communicate and to have a look at my website where you see a few other things there on the website and thank you so much outstanding um thank you professor um uh it's it's very inspiring in in many different perspectives um connecting the past with the present with the future and yeah research wise science wise medicine in general wise and even in life uh, this is really outstanding 